the Catholic Men's Podcast, helping you find good works of literature for the Catholic gentleman. The Best Mystery in Texas by Wallace O. Cheriton. In 1883, Robert E. Ellison and his wife were moving some cattle between Marfa and Alpine in far west Texas. Just before sundown one evening, the couple stopped their wagon on a flat mesa that looked like a perfect place to camp for the night. While his wife unpacked, Ellison tended to the horses and rounded up some wood for a cook fire. The couple planned a quiet evening after a hard day's ride, but the plans changed. Instead, the rancher became an early witness to one of the longest-running, hardest-to-explain Texas mysteries of all time. As Ellison prepared to build his fire, he noticed that some strange lights had suddenly appeared across a valley in the Chinati Mountains. The lights seemed to come and go as if moving. First there was one light, then three, then two. The sight of unexpected lights alarmed Ellison, who immediately assumed the Apaches were on the move and perhaps headed in his direction. He spent the rest of that night sleeping in the dark with one eye open and one hand on his trusty Winchester. Not long after the Ellison incident, a surveyor named Williams, the grandfather of 1990 Texas gubernatorial candidate Clayton Williams, was working in the mountainous area around Marfa and saw the strange lights. He later recorded in his personal journal that the Indians of the region believed the lights to be the spirit of the dead Apache chief, Allsate. Ranchers in the 1890s saw the lights and assumed they were Apache campfires, but were amazed and bewildered when the area was checked the next day and no sign of any fire could be found. Just as an aside, there is proof that these lights exist, and we'll hear about it at the end of this story, so just hang on. The Ellison and Williams reports are the earliest known recorded sightings of the mystery lights, but it is generally believed that Indians in the area had seen illuminated spirits dancing in the desert for many years before the white man arrived. Some people believe that the lights may have been flickering in that portion of Texas for hundreds, even thousands of years, or possibly since the beginning of time. No matter how long they have been there, as the old saying goes, the only thing that is certain about the famous Marfa lights is that nothing is certain. Marfa's mysterious lights are almost as hard to describe as they are to explain. Usually there are from one to three lights, mostly white in color, but often in pastel shades. The lights may appear stationary, but usually they have some movement, frequently described as being similar to a fishing cork bobbing up and down in the water of a West Texas stock tank. It's not uncommon for the lights to move fast in any direction, and they may even blend together to form a streak of light. Sometimes the lights seem to blink on and off like a light bulb, and at other times they fade slowly to blackness and then suddenly brighten up again. For a lot of years, the mystery lights were largely a West Texas story. Residents of that area grew up with the lights and didn't pay them much attention. Then, during World War I, some army observers in the area saw the lights and immediately jumped to the conclusion that there were some sort of spotlights set up to guide an invasion force into the United States from the south. The army was wrong, fortunately, but word of the light slowly began to spread far beyond the desert regions of deep southwest Texas. The strange lights got a real boost in publicity during World War II when the army established a pilot training base near Marfa. Soldiers from all over the nation were shipped into the area for training, and most, if not all, eventually saw the lights during their stay in Texas, It was also during the Second World War that strange stories about the lights started circulating. Today, many of those stories survive, and some of them are actually stranger than the lights are mysterious. Many of the Marfa light tales involve the military, and the wildest is about the purported team of army experts that supposedly went out into the desert, determined to find out what the lights were or die trying. 
According to the tale, they did die trying, but it's just a legend, or more appropriately, a hoax. There is no evidence whatsoever that any team of army personnel died while on a Marfa light expedition. One man later claimed the expedition was actually a bunch of soldiers who got drunk and took off after the lights in a jeep. They didn't catch the lights, but the driver did hit a boulder and turn the jeep over. To cover up the incident, the soldiers set fire to the wreckage and then tried to blame the lights for the mishap. There have been many stories of aerial reconnaissance flights made over the mountainous area in an effort to spot the source of the lights. One army officer claimed that each night a squadron of four planes was sent out on a chase mission, but each time the lights headed for Mexico and disappeared. Not true. Neither is the story that the army sent out planes to bomb the lights with sacks of flour in an effort to pinpoint the spot from which the lights originated. Some claim the flour sacks were, in fact, dropped, but when the site was inspected later, nothing, not even the flour, could be found. The truth is, no reliable evidence has been uncovered to prove that the army has ever done anything concerning the lights. The story about the flour sacks is almost certainly just that, a story. Fritz Call, a flight instructor during the war, did actually try to give chase on one occasion, but he didn't have much luck. Although the lights were bobbing on the horizon when he took off, he never did see them from the air, and thus he could not give pursuit. The story that the lights actually led Kahl into a fiery crash on the side of a mountain is, however, false. He survived the war and later operated the Marfa Airport. The automobile has also played an important role in some of the Marfa light stories. In fact, a lot of people seem to believe that the lights are nothing more than reflections from headlights on automobiles traveling on Highway 67, which runs south from Marfa to Presidio. There are, however, serious problems with that theory. Many reported sightings of the mystery lights occurred long before Highway 67 was built. Some sightings, like those of Ellison and Williams, occurred before automobiles were even invented. Finally, if headlights were the culprit, only cars coming toward Marfa from Presidio could be involved, so the lights would have to move from left to right. While the lights often move in that direction, they are just as apt to move from right to left. This means if cars are the cause, someone is backing up at a high rate of speed, at night, on a dangerous mountain highway. That doesn't seem even remotely possible. Some of the best stories of automobiles and lights involve virtual close encounters between drivers and the lights. There have been some reports of drivers trying to give chase without results. Another tale reversed the circumstances and had one maverick light chasing a car, often at speeds approaching 100 miles an hour. Supposedly, after the light finally disappeared, the driver stopped to check his car and found the rear end scorched as if it had been in a fire. It's a good story, but there's absolutely no verification or evidence to prove it actually happened. Most of the automobile stories involve a driver who narrowly missed having an accident because the lights suddenly appeared over the road. The most bizarre versions, frequently told by students at Sol Ross University and nearby Alpine, had the mystery lights luring automobiles into head-on crashes along Highway 67. Local law enforcement agencies advise that they have no record of any such accident reportedly being caused by strange lights. Drunk drivers, yes, but not the Marfa lights. There have been some reported cases of motorists seeing the lights and thinking they were about to crash into another car, but in every case the lights disappeared and no accident resulted. Occasionally, news teams have traveled great distances with the hope of getting a story, and one of those teams actually had a very close encounter with the usually elusive mystery lights, and the newsboys got pictures to back up the story they later told. It happened in 1980, when the Houston Chronicle dispatched reporter Stan Redding and photographer Carlos Antonio Rios to check out this Marfa light thing and see if there's anything to it. As they were driving down a dirt road on the high black brush flats at Passiano Pass, east of Marfa, the energetic mystery light suddenly appeared, almost close enough to reach out and touch. 
For once, the lights, which usually seemed to just disappear when anyone came close, lingered long enough for Rios to get some pictures. Redding later offered one of the best descriptions ever of the famous lights. He said, They darted about the ground, red, white, and blue orbs, baseball-sized. They would blend into one, then separate. One would zoom high into the air, then plummet down to disappear in the brush, only to pop up an instant later and spin away crazily. Unsupported and unattached, each illuminated the brush over which it hovered. Redding also indicated that it seemed almost like the lights knew somehow that they were being photographed and were intent to put on a show. Another good description came from a man who saw the lights from a bus passing through the area. He said the lights, which appeared to be 200 or so yards from the road, were about the size of basketballs. He saw several balls of light in soft pink and pale yellow that were bobbing up and down, changing colors and size and disappearing, then reappearing quickly, only to disappear once again. One of the strangest Marfa light tales of all time was collected by Ed Sires for his book Ghost Stories of Texas. Sires got the story from Mrs. W.T. Giddens of Sundown, Texas, who said she was given the details by her father, a rancher, who had actually lived the adventure. According to the story, the rancher was up in the Chinati Mountains near Old Shafter, looking for some stray cattle, when a sudden blizzard struck. Ordinarily, the man could have easily found his way home, but darkness was fast approaching, and the howling, icy winds and blowing snow reduced visibility to almost nothing. He was forced to feel his way along what he hoped was the right trail. The man tried to hurry because he knew the temperature was dropping quickly, and if he did not find shelter soon, his frozen body would be found later by search teams. As the panicked rancher inched along, he came to a large outcrop of rocks that he would have to find his way around because it was too dark for any climbing. Being unfamiliar with the territory, he carefully felt his way and started around the rocks. He stopped when suddenly some of the strange mystery lights appeared. Although he never explained exactly how they did it, the rancher claimed the lights spoke and advised him that he was three miles south of Chinati Peak, considerably off course, heading in the wrong direction, and dangerously close to a precipice. The lights advised the rancher to follow them, or he would surely die. Okay, that's a bit far-fetched, but everyone just hang on, there's going to be proof of these lights in just a second, okay? With no alternative he could think of at the moment, the man did follow the lights, and they led him to a small cave that would provide shelter from the fierce storm. The smaller lights disappeared, but the largest one remained in the cave with the rancher, apparently providing much-needed heat and some spirited conversation. According to the rancher, the light claimed they were spirits from elsewhere and long ago. It relayed that they meant him no harm and wanted him to be safe so he could sleep in peace. The next morning, the storm and the light were gone, and as the rancher headed toward home, he passed the outcrop of rocks and discovered that when the lights had intercepted him, he had been on the edge of a sheer cliff several hundred feet high. The man had no doubts the lights had saved his life. Mrs. Giddens told Sires that she believed her father, which is perhaps the daughterly thing to do. She also claimed that after the incident, the lights would often appear in their pasture. She concluded, they're curious and want to investigate things new to them, like the air base was during the war. They're friendly. Our animals had no fear of them at all. As far as is known, Mrs. Giddens tale is the only one in which the lights actually communicated with real people. Apparently, Mrs. Giddens had no explanation for why her particular family would be the only one in history singled out by the lights to be favored with direct communication. One point from the lady's story that does have a solid ring to it is that the lights are friendly. Despite numerous rumors of aggression and downright devilment on the part of the lights, there is no proof of any aggression or that the lights have actually caused any harm whatsoever. The only things the lights are guilty of is being reasonably consistent in their appearances and always managing to avoid explanation. 
There have probably been as many different theories about what causes the lights as there have been strange stories attached to the phenomenon. In the late 1800s, the most popular opinions were that the lights were either current Indian fires or the glow of Indian spirits on some sort of celestial warpath. In more modern times, some scientists have tackled the problem, but honestly the theory about Apache fires makes about as much sense as most of the experts. A common explanation for the phenomena is that the lights are the result of swamp gas escaping from underground pockets and igniting. Perhaps that's the answer, but as many people have pointed out, there hasn't been a swamp in that part of Texas for thousands, perhaps millions of years. If it is swamp gas, there must have been a heck of a lot of it, or perhaps it has just taken a long time to reach the surface. Another popular theory is that the lights are an electrostatic illumination, such as St. Elmo's fire. An expert advised that while something like St. Elmo's fire might be a plausible explanation for the Marfa lights, it's not probable. The experts claim that Ole Elmo's fire only occurs when conditions are absolutely perfect. The Marfa lights, on the other hand, don't appear to depend on anything or on any certain prerequisite. The lights are seen year-round, in all kinds of weather and under all sorts of different atmospheric conditions. Although many have tried, no pattern of any sort can be identified for the Marfa light appearances. The fact that the lights are seen in all sorts of conditions, the expert claimed, also makes it doubtful that they are caused by ball lightning. A few of the scientific deep thinkers have come up with the theory that tremendous pressure is being exerted on underground faults, and the result is that deep underground movement of rocks releases piezoelectric energy, which is manifested as light when it reaches the surface. In other words, there are thousands of tiny earthquakes occurring almost constantly in the area, and they are the culprits in the light mystery, believe it or not. There are plenty of other theories. Some people who can't accept any scientific reasoning believe the lights are not of this world, but rather are UFOs who use that part of Texas as a sort of base. Okay, I'm going to skip this part. Another possibility is that the mystery lights are actually a sort of atmospheric distortion similar to a desert mirage. The theory is that reflections from lights on cars, houses, or even nearby communities are somehow bent over the horizon, so they appear to be actual lights in the mountains. That theory probably makes as much sense as the explanation that the lights are jackrabbits with glowworms attached to their tails. My favorite explanation came from Charlie Eckert. He believes that whatever is causing the Marfa lights is the same phenomenon that produces tiny sparks in your mouth when you bite into a wintergreen lifesaver in a dark room while standing in front of a mirror. Knowing Charlie is one who enjoys a good yank on your leg occasionally, an experiment was conducted to determine if such a thing was possible. Standing there in the darkness of my bathroom, looking considerably more foolish than usual, I bit into a lifesaver. Nothing seemed to happen. I continued until finally I did detect some tiny spark lights in my reflection in the mirror, I have no idea if that has one blessed thing to do with the Marfa lights, but I can say the lifesavers produce sparks. If you want to try it, be sure to use wintergreen because no other flavor works. The Marfa lights finally made the big time in July of 1989 when a crew from NBC's Unsolved Mysteries brought their cameras to Texas to check into the mystery of the lights. That show turned out to be quite a production. Many local Marfa residents were interviewed for first-hand reports of the mysterious lights. One man told how his efforts to track down the lights failed because the lights always seemed to stay far ahead, much like a mirage might do. He said because it was so difficult to judge size and distance in the area that the lights might have been as large as a tire or as small as a cantaloupe. Another witness claimed she was among a group of four people when the lights appeared, but that only she and one other member of the party actually saw them. Very strange. In an effort to get to the bottom of the mystery, the producers of Unsolved Mysteries arranged for three scientists from a nearby observatory and university to conduct some experiments into the cause of the lights. One of the investigators was a chemistry professor, another a geologist, 
and the third was an astronomer. That group was joined by 11 other technicians, observers, and spotters. Because of the presence of Highway 67 through the Chinati Mountains, the investigators wanted to be certain that whatever they might see would not be headlights. Special lights were set up on either end of the stretch of the highway that was visible from near Marfa, so that if any light was seen outside the markers, the scientists would know they were seeing the ghost lights. Spotters were stationed along the road so that they could note any vehicles in the area if the lights seemed to appear. Using sophisticated cameras and night viewing equipment, the crew laid in wait for the lights to make an appearance. Early in the evening, the beams of headlights from an automobile were photographed as they passed between the markers and in front of a beacon of light on a radio tower. Then, at 11.59 p.m., an unknown light appeared outside the markers. Using radio communications, the investigators asked a spotter stationed in the mountains to verify that there was no traffic on the road. There was not, which meant the light could not possibly have been from an automobile. True to the advanced billing, a Marfa light had appeared for a performance. The host of the program, Mr. Robert Stack, described the light as being ghostly gold in color. The bright light appeared visible for a few moments, faded from view, and then returned as bright as before. There was no doubt that the light was not man-made, but the question remained, what was it? One of the scientists thought it might be refracted starlight, another thought it could be luminous gases produced by small earthquakes, no one could say positively what the mysterious light was or what caused it. Although the film crew produced irrefutable evidence that the lights exist, the solution remained as elusive as it had since the earliest recorded sightings. Since the lights have never been anything but a friendly mystery, the people around Marfa who have grown up with the lights as a part of their daily lives are not necessarily interested in anyone solving the mystery. As one lady said on the television program, let's don't find out what they are. Let's just leave them a mystery. I am not going to try to solve it. I'm going to be content with ghosts and let the ghosts take care of them. The best thing about the mystery lights is that they are somewhat predictable. On any given night, they may appear and put on a show for anyone who care to watch. If you want to see for yourself, a special viewing area has been set up just off of Highway 90, about 9 miles east of Marfa. Almost any night, you'll find cars parked there hoping for a glimpse of history. While most of the sightings have been around the area of the viewing spot, the lights have also been reported at other places in the Chinati, La Chienga, and Dead Horse Mountains, as well as around Blue Mountain, located between Marfa and Fort Davis. If you do make the trip, be sure to watch for lights that move in ways automobile or ranch lights could not, so you'll know you're seeing the authentic Marfa lights. As far as a possible solution is concerned, the chances, much to the delight of most folks in Marfa, are slim that anyone will ever come up with a theory that will be universally accepted. For some who are obsessed with seeking the truth for all things unexplained, the lights will continue to be an enigma. For those of us who appreciate a good mystery and an even better legend, the prospect that the best little Texas mystery of all time will never be solved is not particularly unsettling. After all, Life itself would be boring if there weren't a few mysteries around to keep things interesting. If you have an idea that might explain the Marfa lights and you would care to share it, please send your information to the author at Woodware Publishing, Inc. I told you there'd be concrete proof that these lights exist. I had never heard of these lights till a couple months ago and I grew up in Texas. I knew it was a story that would be right up y'all's alley, so that's why I read it here. And please feel free to send me any suggestions for a story that you want me to read to my email, which is in the description of this podcast below. 
And I want to thank all of you for the wonderful support this podcast has received and for all the new listeners that just joined because we had a big subscriber jump. So I hope you enjoyed this story and thank you so much for listening. Godspeed.